So now I want to switch gears and start from the opposite side towards the other conductor type that is most dissimilar to the TEFI type, uh, which would be the NIFE types. So the first sample is somebody you're a little familiar with already. This is Rupert Sheldrake, but this time we're going to track more of his psychology alongside his ontology. So ready? Here we go. Uh, and I'm developing a range of automated telepathy tests so that people can do these anywhere using monomorphic resonance. And um, I have some experiments uh, in the planning stages at the moment in psychology, cell biology, and chemistry. The most recent research I've done on telepathy um, is on telepathy in connection with telephone calls. Many people have the experience of thinking of someone who then rings a coincidence, or is there more to it than that? Um, I've now done many experiments on this subject, and we've found that uh, people are guessing who's calling. Someone forms the intention to call another person on the phone. Uh, the person they're going to call often feels that intention, even before the telephone call. And it fits with my idea of morphic fields and morphic resonance. Okay, so uh, Rupert Sheldrake is somebody who you have to look into yourself to really fully, deeply appreciate. And I, it is beyond the scope of my knowledge to cover him in any in-depth way. But what I do understand is he has theories and hypotheses that there is such a thing as uh, telepathy or, or in other words, consciousness connections across distances. And he wants to even um, affirm these through tests. And he's developed a few tests to try to uh, affirm that. So I've put here telepathy tests. The other thing that he talks about is morphic resonance. So here I have just a little quick snippet from Wikipedia to try to describe it quickly. So Sheldrick's morphic resonance idea posits that memory is inherent in nature and that natural systems inherit a collective memory from all previous things of their kind. Uh, so of their kind is where the morphic aspect of it, in, in other words, if they are isomorphic to it, they have a certain inheritance of the past uh, a connection to everything else that was of that isomorphic shape prior. So Sheldrick proposes that it is also responsible for telepathy type interconnections between organisms. His advocacy of the idea offers idiosyncratic explanations of standard subjects in biology, such as development, inheritance, and memory. So I, I want to present to you this idea that, that he's saying. He's saying that things that are isomorphic to each other, in other words, similar shape, uh, resonate with each other in a non-local sense, in a trans-local sense. And there's a kind of natural memory, a chronological historical uh, memory that is in nature that remembers all the shapes that were like that before and after. And that connects those things, those objects, whether they're minds or anything else, uh, across temporality, across space and time, so spatial temporality. And, and this is very important because this is not something of a vague idea in his mind. It's a very clear idea in his mind. Also, it's a very specific idea that he has. Um, so uh, it, it's not exactly the same as woo-woo because woo-woo is kind of an umbrella term. So we're going to store this idea away. Let's put it in the matrix. I'm gonna, so I'm going to put here as isomorphic resonance non-locally and memory is inherent in nature. So these are the things he's talking about. Okay, so let's listen to him a little more. Which is why I got interested in telepathy in the first place. Um, in the theories I'm putting forward, telepathy seems a natural, normal way uh, that the world works, not paranormal, not supernatural. Um, and indeed, it does seem to be normal and very common. What would be the... We're linked to uh, each other and to our environment. The whole universe is holistic rather than mechanistic. Okay, now we have uh, linked consciousnesses, universe as holistic. Um, we are connected with the natural world, we're part of it. So the, the general message of all this research is about interconnection and a more holistic approach. And I think this is what, something that we need because we live in a very separated, mechanistic kind of world. To psychology, because it points to a wider understanding of the mind, um, 
for ecology and our relationships with the natural world, and for biology and chemistry, because I think both of them are evolutionary sciences. Um, okay, wow, there was a lot in there. But so what we saw is he has a belief that he, he does not consider it to be supernatural in the sense of um, not part of the natural world. Instead, he's describing his belief of how the natural world works. And that belief uh, affirms a kind of interconnectedness of everything. And specifically, he talks about consciousness being interconnected as well. And so this is a bit of a, you have to understand, this is a bit of a, of a philosophical view in some sense. It has a different ontology to the nature of reality. Uh, so that's something that he's describing, um, which is very interesting. I really find Rupert Sheldrake a very fascinating individual. So we're going to leave it at here. There's more we can add, but we already have around six uh, motifs, which are more or less, I think, able to capture the main points of what he's saying. All right, so the next sample here is Roger Wugler. I was raised in the Anglican, which is to say the Episcopalian Church in England, and I was actually a choir boy for many years, so I attended a lot of straight Christian uh, Anglican services. I was interested in what you would call parapsychology, ghosts and spirits, from a very early age. Largely... Okay, he had a religious interest early in life. And then I uh, believe that stemmed from an interest in parapsychology, ghosts and spirits. And again, here, just a quick snippet from Wikipedia. Parapsychology is the study of alleged psychic phenomenon, extrasensory perception, telepathy, precognition, clairvoyance, psychokinesis, uh, and other paranormal claims. For example, those related to near-death experiences, synchronicity, apparitional experiences. It is considered to be pseudoscience, and a vast majority of mainstream scientists reject it. And now notice we see telepathy again pop up here, which is very interesting to me. So I'm adding these motifs here as well underneath parapsychology to expand, to add a bit more detail. They both seem to have what might be called kind of a mystical, esoteric thinking, but neither of them necessarily thinks of it as uh, nonsensical. In other words, it, it, it would maybe be offensive to approach them with such a dismissive attitude as to say something like, because the effects are not locally in contact with the physical world, that, that means that they're not real. They very much believe that things not in contact with the physical world have a reality to them, including the unseen connections across those things. Notice his eyes. Check out how his eyes are very zoned out. They're zoned out the same way as Rupert Sheldrake here. So isn't it very interesting? Here we're seeing two strangers. As far as we know, they're not related at all. Uh, showing a similar voltology where they're very inertial, viscous, and leaning and gazing out and uh, zoned out. Their eyes are hypnotic and they're both talking about uh, telepathy. In the case of Roger Wheeler, he's talking about uh, parapsychology, which includes clairvoyance and near death experiences. In the case of Rupert Sheldrake, he's talking about morphic resonance and the connection of consciousness that we all share and the fact that the universe is holistic and interconnected in everything. Very similar sort of mystical ideas, and these, this set of ideas just seem to be shared between these two guys. So this is when you go, okay, mm, that's a little curious, but uh, two samples is just enough to get a, a speculation going, but it, it's not definitive proof of anything. So we gotta keep looking at more samples to see if what we're seeing is something that um, scales up. So let's continue. This is uh, Robert Gulick. There are other people by this name, by the way. His, uh, I think his name is Robert A. Gulick. So here we go. This matrix exists in many dimensions. In fact, every dimension has its matrix. Very, a little bit hard to hear. He says, this matrix exists in many dimensions. So we start with the divine idea as the original matrix. We can talk about our reality being what we would call the consensus reality. <clears throat> okay, so reality equals consensus reality. We can talk about our reality being what was in many dimensions. In fact, every dimension has its matrix. 
So we start with the divine idea as the original matrix. The divine idea. We can talk about our reality being what we would call the consensus reality. Where does this consensus take place? There is a dimension. There is a dimension where we, would, we can access what we might call the universal Akashic record. There's access to universal Akashic record. There's another dimension where you can access your personal Akashic record. These are all matrices. You walk around in your matrix. We have this energy field, uh, which we call the aura. You walk around in your own matrix, he says. The name I was given is the etheric sheath. Now this is different for yourself. The vehicle that you use to manifest and express yourself in this dimension. So sacred geometry really is about the matrix. Sacred geometry. Uh, okay, I'll stop right there. So this guy is also like Rupert Sheldrake, a, a lot to get into and too much for this uh, short video. So instead, what I'm gonna show you is just like a quick breeze through his website. His name is Robert Aaron Gulick III. And uh, it says here, uh, Robert has led a dual life, one as a career-oriented professional and family man, and the other as a mystic worker in the higher dimensions and service of humanity and the earth. So I'm going to add here, higher dimensions. Okay. Now, if I go to the homepage, uh, you see here uh, the mind matrix. Um, again, I, I can't do these ideas justice, but uh, already we see some connections here between him and Rupert Sheldrake and Roger Wugler. Notice one thing he says is that uh, you walk around in your own matrix. That is a very interesting idea. It's a very uh, panpsychic idea. It's as though saying that our, our conscious experience is kind of a, a phenomenological dimension of its own and that there are multiple dimensions, uh, w which is an interesting framing of, of things. So now there's, there's a few connections that I want to draw here. He talks about sacred geometry, and there's very much a sacred geometry focus in things like this. And Rupert Sheldrake talks about uh, morphic resonance. So things being isomorphic is things sharing the same shape. And sacred geometry is also about the divinity of certain shapes. So there's a shape focus there as well. And uh, now here, just to read a little bit from the website, he says, the mind matrix is reality, a programmable, vertical, multidimensional reality that is the manifestation of the universal cosmic mind, the creator or simply source. The matrix is a description of the cosmic mind. Where have we heard cosmic mind before? Here we saw with Rupert Sheldrake, he says that the universe is holistic and that we're all linked to consciousness. That has a very similar idea to, to Robert Gulick's idea of a cosmic mind. Okay, now this is a very big rabbit hole we could get into, but let's just stop right here because this list is already getting very long and move on to the next sample. Here we go. This is Tom Campbell. I'd like to talk to you today about some of the things that you can do with your consciousness. Some things that you may not know that you can do with your consciousness. You see, in this virtual reality, we are actually co-creators of this reality. And we Very interesting. We just talked about this. So, so I focus on consciousness and he says we are co-creators co in, this, in this reality, which is very interesting to what we just read here, which says that that reality is programmable. In other words, we are making reality uh, through our thoughts proactively. This is the thought behind this guy, and it's the thought behind uh, Tom Campbell as well. One is just in the way we interpret things. 
something happens and we have an interpretation of what happens. Other people see the same thing and they have a different interpretation of what happens. That means everybody lives in their own personal reality. In other words, there's kind of a, a bi-directional relationship here between what reality ends up being and what our conscious experience does so and, and that is also seen in Rupert Sheldrake's morphic resonance uh, because you know to do something like have telepathy influence over reality at a distance there has to be some negotiation between one's conscious experience and the world so at this point you may be starting to get an idea of the psychology behind these individuals and what is shared among them and notice again how this is connected to their voltology. Here we have again the hypnotic eyes, the very zoned out forward gaze. So I'm just inviting you to observe a phenomenon where they're just, there happen to be these people, they happen to all share voltology, and they all happen to share similar um, intrinsic beliefs about the ontology of the universe. It's, it's, not, it's not an opinion that they came across so much. If you think about what they're saying, it's it's a conclusion they naturally came to over and over, each of them, by their own contact with reality and their framing of what it is. There's, there's different language being used here, but at the, at the end of these videos, we'll try to summarize what might be essential to the different languages used. Because, you know, if there is something at core behind people, then every person, right, every type is going to, every individual is going to be kind of describing it differently, describing their own psychology to you differently, the conclusions, the, the fundamental cognitive uh, assumptions that they make. And so we can go into that later, but they're definitely sharing some cognitive assumptions about the ontology of reality. Okay, so now we're going to go into a slightly different set of samples, beginning with Eckhart Tolle. It's a pseudo sense of self. So it's a great reluctance on the part of most people to let go of thinking because which is equated with the state of sleep to let go of thinking there isn't that much to understand in this teaching there's a little bit to understand about how the ego works but even that is just mainly a self-observation the main thing about it is presence so Ed Cartel talks about letting go of the ego he talks about how in some sense, our egoic finitude, our egoic narrowness, confines our existence and blinds us to the, the fact that there, there is no singular self. There is no isolated in, individual. But there, but there can be just a, a simple existence within a universal presence. Contact with that thing is what he aspires to have. Presence is a space of no thought but presence can also be there in the background even notice his eyes are also hypnotic as we see here and his his again his, his body posture is very inertial in the way it moves very slowly his uh, he has a narrow head zoning thinking is happening you can still be not completely involved in the thinking thinking loses the ability to create havoc in your life letting go of the ego letting go of thought confuse you so it, your choice then is not to understand more or to bring some intellectual analysis to the practice but to practice the state of not thinking which can be arrived at by various ways as you probably know if you don't think about it just do it uh, s becoming more aware of the present moment and accept it as it is slows down the overactive mind is one thing because a lot of the overactivity of the mind is t an attempt to get away from the isness the simplicity of the present moment focus uh, on the isness of the present Okay, and so in some ways, we're getting a little bit of a relief from the view of the other guys. He's a little different, but he's still focused on consciousness, but he's saying a little bit of a different message. Now, let's continue here with an example. This is Osho. I just live moment to moment. 
so you cannot. Notice his eyes are very hypnotic also. And his forward gaze, we talked about him before, so let's listen to what he has to say. Confine me into a personality. Live moment to moment and cannot confine me into a personality. You cannot define me. You cannot predict me. I don't know even myself what I am going to do tomorrow morning. I am simply as open as the existence and as indefinable as the existence itself. So self as undefinable as the existence itself. Now here, notice we're, we're seeing very similar connection to Edgar Tolle in this case. Edgar Tolle talks about letting go of the ego, letting go of thought, uh, and also like letting go of identity of yourself with your thoughts. People think I am my thoughts, I am what I think, what I believe, etc. Eckhart Tolle says that's all an illusion. Osho also says that's an illusion of himself anyway. He says that uh, he lives moment to moment without thinking of himself through a personality that he is. And living moment to moment has parity with uh, focusing on the isness or on uh, the presence. presence. So we're seeing a nice little convergence here between these two guys and between these other four guys on top. So they're like slightly different shades happening here. And you'll see an IFE's having focuses on a, a variety of motifs, but there's always like a set of motifs that surrounds a given type. All right, so now we want to step away from the mystics for a little bit, or are we? I don't know. But let's look at uh, Ray Kurzweil. I doubt we're going to find consciousness is over in this particular region. I think it's really an emergent property of the very complex interaction of lots of, lots of different areas. We have discovered actually the spindle cells, which are fairly unique in human beings. There are some other uh, primates that have them. I think great apes have four to 8,000. We have 80,000 80, still. So in, notice him uh, that he, his eyebrows are not uh, raised to the sides, but they are raised in the middle. So there's a taut preceptal area, which is the area immediately above the eyelid. So, so this is a variant of what can be in eye eyes as well. It doesn't have to have the, the upward lift corners. The, the main element here is that there's a tautness of, of the, basically the brow being lifted up above the eyes while the upper eyelids are lowered down. And that's exactly what he has. So for those of you who don't know Ray Kurzweil, he has several focuses that he's, he's famous for. One of them is he wrote a book on how to build a mind. So he has a consciousness focus. So his focus is on building consciousness in the sense of actually uh, making living creatures uh, using artificial intelligence. A fairly small number, but these are unique cells that span the entire brain and are deeply interconnected. And one spindle cell can sp have hundreds of thousands of connections and interact with dozens of other regions, maybe hundreds of other regions. We're, and those are going to be very hard to reverse engineer until we reverse engineer all the different regions that they communicate with, but they do seem to light up in brain studies when... He's talking about science and neurology. And ...or dealing with some emotional subject. So they have something to do with human emotion. But human emotion is, is part of what the brain does. And generally when we talk about consciousness, people are talking about feelings, which have to do with emotion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fundamentally, I think, Consciousness is a philosophical issue. It's not really something we could scientifically determine and have an entity and have some kind of test that we definitively say this is conscious and this is not. But there is apparent consciousness, certain types of behaviors that where we say that this human being is conscious. And that really is, gonna, is I believe, an emergent property of the complex interaction of, of all the different regions. Uh, it's not, we're not going to find one center of consciousness. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand this to be building consciousness, but also the nature of consciousness, that's his focus, and also science and neurology. I'm going to add a few things here, though, because he talks about so much that it's, it can't all be captured in a two-minute video, but part of what he's about is uh, explained here in uh, the wiki. Uh, Kurzweil is a public advocate for the futurist and transhumanist movements and gives public talks to share his optimistic outlook on life extension technologies and the future of nanotechnology robotics and biotechnology. So I'm going to lump these together here as transhumanism being one and futurism being another, which includes the other uh, sub components of that. 
All right, and now we're going to see a four split screen summary of them so you can see kind of what the entire uh, essence of their volatility looks like. So the people can do these anywhere so using on morphic resonance. Great reluctance. And um, I have some experiments that go uh, in the planning that. stages at the moment because in it's psychology, cell biology. Once again, I get this uncanny similarity. The way they talk, what they say is so similar. I bet they would totally be friends. Ministry. We the the most recent research I've done on telepathy is on telepathy and telephones, but even that is just where many people have the experience. So I hope I hope you're coming to see so far with the videos I've gone through in just these two types that um, it's it's not so easy to dismiss the idea that there may be connections between body mannerisms and psychology. Uh, some people just jump to the conclusion that there can be no connection and they just kind of dismiss it, or they think, well, maybe there is some connection, but it can't be that great. In other words, the the, the subjectivity in measuring or estimating, guesstimating to what degree and how much the effect may be relevant or not relevant is something people use shortcuts to, to block out for their investigation. Uh, but unless you actually look, you don't know what the degrees are. How much is there of a connection? Is it 10%? Uh, is it 90%? Because that makes a big difference. You could say, sure, um, there's a connection between voltology and psychology, but if you put it at 20%, then you can kind of dismiss it as something you know, similar to what you might see with the uh, broader faces being more connected to aggression, but that's it, you know, that you can't have make a whole typology off of that. But I hope I can show you that the degree to which we can say things based on voltology about people's psychology is way more than what most people estimate in their minds, way more than what they anticipate. But part of why they can't see it is because there's, there's a higher reality in which the similarity exists. So for example, if I took any individual thing that these men said on their own, uh, the, the, and I wanted to do something as silly as, let's say, uh, measure similar words used, you know, then you, you may find that uh, they share some words in common, but not all the words. But it gets much more relevant when I'm looking at not just like isolated words, like, did they say telepathy? Did they say telepathy? Oh, yes, they did. Okay, there's a match, but most of their words are not matching. Yeah. Instead, if you look at the conceptual bubbles, so what is telepathy connected to more broadly as a thematic set? And then you see these thematic, uh, whether these themes intersect with each other, then you start to see an enormous correlation between these individuals, where all of them have some thematic convergence among themselves in what they're saying. Just as like, you know, telepathy is very much connected to clairvoyance and, and, and for example, accessing the universal Akashic records is very similar to Rupa Sheldrake's idea that memory is inherent in nature. So this idea being said in two different ways, it, it, but the, the, the core idea is the universe in some ways stores all past information that, that ever happened. And that is in some way accessible to consciousnesses because they're linked within what is ultimately a full reality, a cosmic mind that we all are a part of. That is a very specific kind of idea. And that is just being articulated different ways by different people. And it's, 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 very, it's very odd to think specific ideas might cluster themselves around people. Uh, because, but see, this is why this is a cognitive type. I'm not so much measuring behavior. Behavior is a second order of what I'm saying. I'm saying like there's something beneath the behavior that is similar in the way they're thinking about their reality, in the way they're thinking about life. Uh, and so with the TESIs that we saw earlier, they may express in different ways their desires and motives but in, and their viewpoints. But in all cases, it's some variation of, of some bias for viewing reality as mechanistic, some bias for viewing reality as a sort of impersonal but manipulable objective world in which you can win, you can succeed, you can achieve, uh, whether that is through finances, whether that is through banking, investing, whether that is through political campaigning, some sort of power gain can happen through properly executing yourself within this objective reality. That's what is at the root cognitively of all these individuals. And what is at the root cognitively of the NIFEs seems to be that we are all in some ways within a universe which by its own ontology connects us all. And we are all in a ways, uh, different perspectives, different 
uh, dimensional fragments of a whole, like a kaleidoscope fragmentation, and that because of that, there's a connection between our consciousness and other people's consciousness, and there, and that and our consciousness and the universe, and that connection between us and the universe is bidirectional, so we can alter the universe in that way. That's more or less the idea of what I'm saying here. Now, here's where I can get into some trouble because um, any individual on the planet might say, "Well, I believe that too." You know, you may, you will come across some te size because there are every kind of person who can believe every kind of idea. And you say, "Well, I know a te size who believes that idea." That's very fine and nice. My point is not so much about a specific belief that any individual person might articulate one way. What I'm trying to point out here is something that must transcend specific beliefs. Uh, it's not like, oh, if you agree with this idea, you are this type, which is how a lot of other typologies do it. You have to, you have to look beneath the symptoms, a core underlying reality, and that does not have any specific description or content. It is content void. Content is what emerges when that essential uh, psychology finds an expression in the world through the medium of the people that possess it. So it can't be reduced back down to specific ideas, and yet it produces similar ideas in different forms. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to get at here with these typings. We're trying to get at the universal conscious experience of the individual types behind what they're saying. And I'm walking you through how it is that we start to develop an understanding of that. Okay, so we're just about done with the NIFEs, but I actually, before we move on to another type, I want to show you some female examples of them too, because we have to show male and female differences. Otherwise, it's not a complete picture. So here are some that we found. It was a bad shock. At that time, we settled down in a small town in the southeastern part of Norway, where the Norwegian Missionary Society had a property. And so we could stay there rather cheaply. And it was an industrial town and uh, uh, very much dominated by socialism and social de de democrats. And they were not particularly friendly towards the uh, mission. Uh, she's doing two things here. She's giving you a story, a narrative, right? Uh, monologuing about that. And then she's, she's swerving into um, a focus on the politics. So personal narratives, memories, and also politics. And at that time, very few Norwegians knew much about mission work at all. The climate is entirely different now because Norwegians know more about developing countries. And it was a, a very, very bad shock. Uh, I can uh, give an, as an example that we... Notice here the hypnotic eyes, very much like the others here as well. But in her case, she's, um, at least in this small clip, she's not being much of a mystic. She's being more of a of a PI type, remember. So the NI leads are first and foremost PI types. And as a PI, they have a focus on volumetric information, a lot of in knowledge. Well, in the case of the ones above, we saw that with the focus on the Akashic record, right? That's a very archival PI focus, as well as the thought that there's memory inherent in nature. So we see the PI focus in what they're saying here. But down here, we actually have more of a practical real world effect uh, examples of PI in the sense of like um, remembering and having a lot of volumetric knowledge. Now we're going to move on to uh, Mahaswari Devi. Mission is a big word. Uh, when I was asked. Uh, this lady has some uh, JI mixed in here, but I put it here just because we have so few of these uh, women that I want to show them side by side. If my name so she has the J.I. eyes disengaging down, but at the same time she has the inertia of the body. Me to be commended for the national award. Would I accept it or not? I said I am an Indian, and if it's a national award, I'd be proud to accept it. And I know you can't see it in this video because it, this is from a long time ago, and she's very old back then. But here is a close up of her eyes. You can see the the raised uh, the top. Uh, preceptal area and the lower pretarsal area, which is the eyelids here. So she has that zoned out look. Now, as for her, if we read from Wikipedia here, we see that uh, she was uh, an Indian writer. 
in Bengali and an activist. Uh, she was a leftist who worked for the rights and empowerment of tribal people of uh, West Bengal and uh, other places here. And she was honored in various literary awards. So she was a writer, a literary uh, writer, but also a writer about current social affairs of individual people. So we can add that here. Uh, academic writer in sociology. I don't, I don't just want to put writer because I mean, who? everybody who writes a book is a writer, but we have to get more specific than that. So she writes about the sociology of, uh, of the tribal people in India, and she has a focus on human rights and activism. So in, in this case, these two women are a little bit more similar to each other. They're both focused on more of the effects that are happening within wherever they are as far as, you know, the social space and things that may be not going as we would hope for. So we see a little bit of a bubble here as well. They're both very sociologically inclined and, and concerned. Okay, so that wraps up our first look at the NIFE types. Now, having said all of this, I wanna take a moment and just say that I don't know what other people may mean from coming from the Jungian typology community by terms like uh, INFJ. I don't know how what many ways they might describe that, whether it's resonating with a certain psychological profile from this website or that website or this author or that author. I don't know what other people might mean, but I can say that what I mean by NIFE is this, the pattern that I just showed you, uh, the volatility psychological match that I just demonstrated here. That is, so if, if this is not you, if this is not what you look like, what you gesticulate like, if you don't have this zoned out stare, this inertial body energy, and the corresponding psychological parallels here, then at least in model one, that uh, disqualifies you as NIFE because NIFE, remember, is a voltological category, which is reactive, fluid, measured, and grounded. N nothing else qualifies you for that. So if you like a certain psychological profile and, and it, that sounds like you, um, we're not talking about the same thing. This is a contentless cognitive essence. The idea of innate type is incompatible with the methodology of discerning type by um, matching to yourself to a psychological portrait. You don't decide your blood type based on whether or not you resonate with four profiles. No, you, you, your blood type is determined uh, abiotically, your blood type is determined scientifically through instrumentation because it's not about how you resonate or don't resonate with a certain psychological description. So we have to think of the, the very separate models. Model one is not a psychological portraits theory. It doesn't use psychological pro portraits as its classification criteria. Instead, it uses voltology as its classification criteria, and then that tends to cause an emergent psychological portrait, which can be descriptive of what that voltology is like psychologically. And I mentioned this because uh, INFJ is a very popular type online, and a lot of people may come to this video believing themselves to be that type, and maybe even looking at their voltology to see if they match this, which I would question as being a categorical error, because different systems in the Jungian tradition have different definitions, and the systems don't have complete parity among each other. So if you wanted to be INFJ in that system by a one-to-one -one match with a certain profile, then fine, you can be that type, but that's not what we mean by an IFE in this model. So bear that in mind as we go through the rest of the videos here, because that's something that applies to all the types in model one.